Our scripture lesson today comes from the Acts of the Apostles, the ninth chapter, a passage that may be familiar to many of you, but I invite you to listen with new ears as I read the scripture for us today. Meanwhile, Saul was still spewing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest seeking letters to the synagogues in Damascus. If he found persons who belonged to the way, whether men or women, these letters would authorize him to take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. During the journey as he approached Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven encircled him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice asking him, Saul, Saul, why are you harassing me? Saul asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are harassing, came the reply. Now get up and enter the city. You will be told what you must do. Those traveling with him stood there speechless. They heard the voice but they saw no one. After they picked Saul up from the ground, he opened his eyes, but he couldn't see. So they led him by hand into Damascus, and for three days he was blind and neither ate nor drank anything. In Damascus, there was a certain disciple named Ananias, and the Lord spoke to him in a vision. Ananias! He answered, Yes, Lord. And the Lord instructed him, Go to Judas's house on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias enter and put his hands on him to restore his sight. Ananias countered, Lord, I have heard many reports about this man. People say he's done horrible things to your holy people in Jerusalem. He's here with authority from the chief priest to arrest everyone who calls on your name. And the Lord replied, Go. This man is the agent I have chosen to carry my name before the Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, that story is one that has been told over and over and over again in Sunday school lessons. And it goes by the title, The Conversion of St. Paul. But I wonder, do we really understand what conversion means? Many of us are like the first grader who was in Sunday school and who was quizzed by the pastor on meeting certain religious terms like baptized and repentance. And the pastor asked the child, what is conversion? And the little boy thought for a moment, and then he said, oh, I know exactly what it is. It's that extra point that is kicked after a touchdown. <laughs> well, yeah, but in a biblical sense, Conversion means a change in direction. In the Old Testament, it means to return or to go back. The verb form appears over a thousand times in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, it has to do with change in direction of a person's life. Change is what conversion is all about. You don't need a blinding light. You don't need to hear audible voices to have a conversion. But there must be change. Today I'm concluding the sermon series that we've entitled Reset. 
we began talking about resetting our souls, reminding ourselves that we are all created in God's image, reminding ourselves of who we are and whose we are, that when we are baptized, we are named and claimed by God as beloved, and we are given a mission and a ministry to share that message with others. And then we talked about resetting our purpose, trying to find our direction in life, what we are called to do, how we are specifically gifted to be in ministry, to share God's love with the world. And then we talked about resetting our values, not allowing ourselves to get caught up in the values of the world, but staying true to the values that we learned from Jesus' life, his teaching. Today I want to talk about resetting our direction, making sure that we are living that life, the life of the beloved, the life of the one on mission from God. In this dramatic story of Paul's conversion, if you remember anything about Paul before he wrote all of the letters that we read from his hand in the New Testament, his name was Saul, and he was a devout Jew. And he was one who believed that the followers of the way, those who called themselves Christians, those who believed in Jesus' resurrection, were going astray that they were corrupting the Jewish faith. And so he wanted to arrest them. He wanted to stifle the movement. He wanted to put a stop to the growth of the Christian movement. He really felt like he was following God's call. He wanted to do what God had called him to do. But he was on a wrong path. He's on that road to Damascus, the text we read today says, because he had received permission to arrest any of the Christians that he saw in Damascus. He is on a mission to stop persons who believe differently from what he believes. As I wrestled with the text this week, I couldn't help but think, about how much of that is going on in our world today. Persons who believe so strongly that their faith belief is the only faith belief that everybody ought to abide by and understand. And they're trying to squash the voices of others rather than listen to the voice of others to discern God's truth in the midst of it all. Saul is on that road, and he is on his way to Damascus, where Christians are gathered together like we are here today. They're gathered together praising God, singing of God's glory, fellowshipping with one another. For the book of Acts begins by telling us that the church grew and that the people shared everything in common that they shared meals together, they took care of one another, they studied the scriptures, they worshiped God together. And Saul is on his way to stop that fellowship. When he is blinded by a light and he hears God's voice speaking to him, asking, why are you persecuting me? Now, it harkens back to the scriptures that we read in the Gospels where Jesus said, when you did it unto the least of these, you did it unto me. When Saul is persecuting the Christians, he is persecuting Christ himself. But he doesn't realize that till he hears that voice. He is blinded for three days, and don't mistake this, Jesus was in the tomb for three days, right? And on the third day, arose to new life. Likewise, Paul has a resurrection, a new beginning, new life after that third day. Now we read this story of Paul's conversion. 
And we often miss the fact that there's another conversion going on in this story at the same time. For in the middle of that dramatic and traumatic story of change in Paul's life, there's another little man that is mentioned briefly that I mentioned to the children today. His name is Ananias. Paul is led off by hand by his companions because in that light he is blinded and he can't see his way. And he is led into Damascus. He cannot eat or drink or find his own way. This man who was a strong persecutor of the Christians is now weak and lost and wondering what he's going to do with his life. And Ananias hears the voice of God coming to him saying, Ananias, rise and go to the street called Straight, and there you will find this man, and you are to go to him and lay your hands on him. And Ananias, can you put yourself in his place? He can hardly believe what he is hearing. He hears God's voice telling him to go to this man who was ready to arrest him and all of his friends and family members who are worshiping God together. He's to go and put himself in harm's way to actually go to this man who was coming to him to arrest him. And he's to go with an act of mercy and love and grace towards this man. So I can imagine Ananias really saying, what did you say? Saul, you want me to go to him? Uh, I, I, I think you're confused. Uh, no. He's the guy who wants to arrest me. He's the guy who wants to throw me in prison. Why would I go to him? And the voice simply replies, go. And the amazing thing to me is, Ananias goes. He doesn't put up any more protests. He doesn't give any more excuses. He obeys and he goes. He goes and when he goes and he sees Saul, the scriptures say that instead of calling him horrible names instead of just kind of, okay, hey, bye. He actually does place his hand on Saul and he calls him brother. He calls him brother. Ananias laid hands on him and became a minister to him, a priest to him. And in relaying this story, Will Willimon comments, Poor Ananias. We wonder how he must have received all of this. But unfortunately, we'll never know because we never hear about Ananias again. He evidently went back home and on about his own business, having played his part in the great drama of Christian conversion. But without his willing assistance, Paul might never have been converted. It's interesting. Details in the scripture are put there for a reason, and sometimes we just pass right over them. But this little detail about this little man named Ananias reminds me that God uses ordinary people in extraordinary ways. And behind every great person and every great movement in history there are ordinary people. Years ago, Helen Keller was invited to Yale University to receive an honorary award, the first woman to ever receive such an award from Yale University. And after the ceremony was over, someone commented to the president of Yale University, you know, you really should have given out two honors today. It was right to give Helen Keller an award, but you forgot about Annie Sullivan, her teacher. For without Annie Sullivan and Helen Keller's life, Helen Keller would not have been who she was. I wonder what we can learn from Ananias 
What can we learn about being the ordinary people that God uses? The ordinary people that God uses as channels of love to help change this world one person at a time. For when we are converted to Christ, we are not simply converted into loving Christ, but we are converted into people who love the people that Christ loves. We are commanded to love all people that Christ loves. God's love is always reaching out, always grasping hold of lives and changing them for the better, always bringing lost sheep into the fold. It's one thing to love Jesus, but it's quite a challenge to love all the people that Jesus loves. Think about the people who get under your skin. Think about the people who bug you. Think about the people who put posts on your social media sites that irritate you. It's difficult to love all the people and call them brother. Ken Miedema is a wonderful musician and singer, Christian artist who is also blind. Few having heard Ken Miedema in concert will ever forget his music or his witness in those concerts. Once he was singing at Duke Chapel at Duke University, and he commented to the students, I'm a member of a Baptist church in California. At least I thought it was Baptist. But the convention has just told us that we're bad, real bad. See, we thought as Baptists we were supposed to go out and baptize everybody we could get our hands on. So we were just baptizing and baptizing. And then some in the convention asked us, what did you go and baptize people like that for? And we said, we didn't know Jesus just wanted us to baptize some people, but not all people. And they said, you can't be close with people like that people who have sex in certain ways. And we said, we didn't know that you had to have sex in a certain way to be baptized. Show us in the Bible where it says that. You see, we Baptists are real big on the Bible, so show us where it is. Well, Medeba said he never got the answer. And maybe that's the acid test for whether or not we've really been converted. Converted to persons who bear the name of Christ. Whether or not we can really see everyone as our brother, as our sister, as our sibling. Whether or not we can see even our enemies as those for whom Christ died. So as this vision and action of Ananias stare me in the face, the penetrating question that I have for myself and for each one of us is, are we willing to be like Ananias? Are we willing to follow Jesus with the same kind of trust and commitment to go wherever Jesus calls us to go? Even if it seems illogical, even if it seems risky, even if it seems irrational, is there enough courage in us to follow Jesus into the face of our enemies and to seek change? You know, it breaks my heart when I think about what is happening in the United Methodist denomination right now as we are fighting with one another and treating one another like enemies in different churches. Some who read the scriptures a certain way and others who read the scripture a different way fighting with one another over whether or not clergy in United Methodist churches can be persons who are self-professing lesbian, gay, or transgender persons. Fussing and arguing with one another over whether or not clergy in United Methodist churches can officiate at same gender unions. 
what the world sees us doing is rooted in fear and rooted in hate, not rooted in love. Do we have the courage to reach out to brothers and sisters and to love them and to love them? Perhaps we are meant to learn from Ananias that we are to trust God and continue to follow the way of love. One of the ways that I believe we can reach out in love to persons who are feeling misplaced and displaced by churches who are seeking to leave the United Methodist denomination is we can continue to be a place of open hearts, open minds, open doors, and open spirits, a place of welcome and affirmation, a place that says you belong and you are loved here, you are a child of God. There is an incredible opportunity for us coming up in the next couple of weeks. An incredible opportunity that is being funded by a campaign called He Gets Us. How many of y'all have seen commercials, He Gets Us? Well, the He Gets Us people have put Jesus in the Super Bowl this year. They will run two ads during the Super Bowl this year. And persons can text a number when they see those commercials if they are seeking help, hope, healing, and love, if they are searching for a place to belong, if they are dealing with anxiety or depression or difficulty or grief or pain in this world. They can text that number, and if they live in the geographic area around Washington Street United Methodist Church, their name will be referred to us, and we can reach out to them in love and grace and offer to hear their stories and allow them to hear our stories and allow them to see Christ in us as we see Christ in them. So I want us to do a couple of things. I want to encourage you to do a couple of things. One is I want to encourage you to watch the Super Bowl you thought you'd never come to church and hear a preacher say, I want you to watch football. But that's what I want you to do. I want you to watch the Super Bowl. And I want you to invite your family and your friends and your neighbors and your co-workers and fellow students to watch the Super Bowl with you, especially if you know persons who are not connected to a faith community. If you know persons who are dealing with difficulties and struggles and pains in their life, Invite those persons to watch the Super Bowl with you. And I want you to sign up to receive text messages. Text messages from the He Gets Us campaign. We'll have that information for you going out in email this week, and we'll have it in our bulletin next week. But you'll simply text the word Super Bowl to a particular number, and you'll receive a text message letting you know when the commercials are about to come on so that you're not out getting a snack when it comes on, but you can watch the commercials and it will give you talking points to talk with your friends about your faith. And then I want you to do one more thing. I want you to begin today praying, praying for this campaign and praying for the people who are hurting praying for the people who are feeling displaced as their United Methodist churches are struggling and as they feel that they are losing their church home. Pray for the people in our community who need the love of Christ to touch their hearts and their lives in powerful ways. When the Super Bowl is over, we will have a phone number for you to receive text messages from a phone number that's unique to Washington Street United Methodist Church. And I will invite you at that time to enter with me in specific nine days of prayer. Prayer for healing, hope, reconciliation, and love to reign in this world. Each day you'll receive just a two or three sentence prayer prompt. 
asking you to join me in prayer. My friends, we are all called to be like Ananias, to reach out to the persons around us. For We live right now in a world that is very dark, a world that seems difficult, filled with so much hate, hate and pain and difficulty. And I'm reminded of an old, old story that was told by a rabbi, a story that the Reverend John Holler told to me many years ago. The story is this. There once was a rabbi who asked his students, Master, how should one determine the hour in which night ends and day begins? And one student responded, It is when a person can distinguish a sheep from a dog in the distance. No, the rabbi said, that is not when night ends. A second student ventured, well, it's when you can distinguish a date tree from a fig tree from afar. No, that's not it either, said the rabbi. Please tell us the answer, the students begged. How should one determine when night has ended and day has begun? And the wise rabbi said this, it is when you look in the face of a stranger and you see your sister or brother. Until then, it is night. Night is always with us until we see in the face of the stranger our sister and brother. May we have the courage to so live. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.